On tonight's broadcast, it's official. It's now a swine flu global pandemic, the first such warning in decades. And now what next? Anatomy of a murder, new information about the Holocaust Museum shooting and what drove the killer to the brink. Cracking down, the government gets broad, new, and historic power to regulate cigarettes and other tobacco products. And a golden opportunity in a disaster zone. Some real pros come out of retirement to lend a hand, a great example of what works. Also tonight, the best-selling new car in America. This one will surprise you. Nightly News begins now. From NBC News World Headquarters in New York, this is NBC Nightly News with Brian Williams. Good evening. Today it became official. While it turns out to be a milder illness than a lot of people had feared or predicted, the swine flu was today declared a global pandemic, the most serious category there is, and the first of its kind in over 40 years. We begin the broadcast tonight with our chief science correspondent, Robert Bazell. He's in Miami for us this evening. Bob, good, good evening. Good evening to you, Brian. This is hardly a surprise. The signs have been pointing toward a pandemic that is a global outbreak of a new influenza virus ever since flying flu first appeared in April. But this is a big moment in public health and a strong signal to every nation on Earth. The world is now at the start of the 2009 influenza pandemic. Dr. Margaret Chan, Director General Previous Pandemics in Modern Times. The one in 1918 killed 50 million people worldwide. In 1957, 2 million people died. And in 1968, the toll was 1 million. All indications for now are that this will be a low mortality pandemic. But officials warn that the virus could change as it moves from place to place and over time. And they're also concerned that it strikes mostly young people. Brian? Robert Pazell on the story for us tonight in Miami. Bob, thanks. We know much more tonight about the man accused of yesterday's attack at the U.S. Holocaust Museum in Washington. He's now been charged with murder, and officials say he left behind a note about guns and hatred. We also learn more about the final moments for the security guard who was killed in the attack. Pete Williams is outside the museum for us tonight and has more. Pete, good evening. Brian, the FBI senior agent here in Washington said today we know what the man accused of the shooting did. Now we need to know why. And it may turn out to be an obsession with guns as well as a raging anti-Semitism. Oh. The security guard killed in the shooting was remembered today at a vigil outside the Holocaust Museum. Authorities say the last act of Officer Stephen Johns was one of kindness, apparently thinking the elderly man who approached, James Von Brunn, needed help. Special Police Officer Johns was kind enough to open the door uh, to allow uh, him to enter. As he entered, uh, he raised the rifle, opened fire, striking uh, Special Police Officer Johns. I'm going to miss him so terribly. Um, he's my only child, and um, he was a loving, a loving son. Windows at the museum entrance bore evidence of the rounds fired by the other guards that hit Von Brunn. Federal prosecutors today charged him with first-degree murder, a crime that could bring the death penalty. Investigators say he double-parked this red Hyundai at the museum entrance. In the car, they found a notebook in which Von Brunn wrote, in part, quote, You want my weapons? This is how you'll get them. The Holocaust is a lie. Obama was created by Jews. Obama does what his Jew owners tell him to, end quote. So here you have... But a white, white separatist who talked with him just two weeks ago says Von Brunn never mentioned President Obama and was worried about money. He complained to me that uh, Social Security, at some time in the past, had slashed his uh, Social Security check by about half and he was having it very hard to make ends meet. Federal agents say he was living with his son at this apartment in Annapolis, Maryland, paying $400 a month rent. FBI agents say they were aware of his anti-Semitic website, but that he was not under investigation. No matter how offensive to some, we are keenly aware that expressing views is not a crime, and the protections afforded under the Constitution cannot be compromised. While Barack Obama's election has stirred the passions of some white separatists, a former FBI official who tracked hate groups says overall there's been no spike in activity. Reluctant to call it either a resurgence or a spike based on what is now 
uh, an incident that clearly deserves the attention of law enforcement and of the public. FBI agents are working to reconstruct the last few days of Von Brunn's life, but say tonight they believe he acted alone, and tomorrow the Holocaust Museum reopens its doors to the public. Brian? Pete Williams outside the museum tonight in Washington. Pete, thanks. History was made in Washington today on the subject of smoking. It kills more than 400,000 Americans a year, and now the government is about to get sweeping new power to regulate cigarettes and other tobacco products. A bill passed the Senate today by an overwhelming majority after being passed by the House in April. Now it's on a fast track for the president's signature. We get more from NBC's Kelly O'Donnell. Ready for high school graduation. 18-year-old Elizabeth Cook is proud to be a quitter. I haven't had a cigarette in about a month and a half. Um, I slipped up a couple times. And I'm a girl, so I want to buy that. And what about the powerful tobacco industry? One big cigarette maker actually supported this bill because with all the FDA's new power, Congress did agree the agency would not eliminate the use of nicotine or ban cigarette sales. Kelly O'Donnell, NBC News, Washington. Voters in Iran may be hours away from making history. This is the eve of an election in Iran that may change that country in a big way. President Ahmadinejad is in trouble. He may be in the midst of a slowly building, slowly burning uprising against him, and the election is being watched closely for any signs, among other things, that President Obama's recent Middle Eastern venture made a connection. Our chief foreign correspondent, Richard Engel, is in Tehran and with us tonight with the very latest. Richard, for those who don't follow and study Iran, this came out of nowhere. During our last interview with Ahmadinejad in Tehran, he gave off the aura of a guy firmly in control, seemingly able to crush opposition. Where did this come from? Good evening, Brian. Many here describing this as a possible turning point. Almost no one in this country, particularly the government, expected that the youth, the students, would turn out in the tens of thousands to demand change. They want the end of Iran's isolation. It took this government very much by surprise. Officials here had been calling for students to come out to participate in the campaign, but they had not expected this kind of anger that we've been seeing on the streets. There was no campaigning today. President Ahmadinejad still does have a strong base of support, particularly in rural communities and among the urban poor. But lower oil prices, Obama's message of outreach, and rising inflation in this country have all chipped away at his lead. Brian? So if an uprising fails uh, this time, I guess there's no putting that genie back in the bottle. And what's the chance this whole process ends without a shot being fired? There are concerns here that no matter what happens tomorrow, the, 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 the party that does not win could turn violent. Though the, many in the government have called for calm, this country has never been more divided. It would be difficult for the, the government, if it did win, to, to have a crackdown because if it were to win and Ahmadinejad stayed in power, this kind of emotion that has come out onto the streets would be difficult to contain. All right, this is supposed to be a day of peace throughout Iran. No campaigning allowed, but Richard Engel will stay in place and will be there for the vote and the results tomorrow. Richard, our thanks for tonight. When our broadcast continues along the way on a Thursday evening, Amazing new figures out tonight on the new number one best-selling American car. Also tonight, the big, big man with a big name but no political experience taking on a major challenge in an American city with big troubles. And later, an army of volunteers rescuing neighborhoods from ruin. It's an example of what works. Women. Sunday on Meet the Press, Vice President Joe Biden, the exclusive interview, only on Meet the Press, Sunday on NBC. We go next to Detroit, a city with big troubles and a new man in charge. The last mayor there became a household name because he got prison time. The new man is a household name to longtime NBA fans. Mayor Dave Bing is used to come from behind victories, but this job might be something else entirely. He granted the first network evening newscast interview to our own Mara Schiavacampo, who reports tonight from Detroit. Before the cleaning crew has even finished the news, Detroit. 
Speaking of cars, we mentioned this earlier. New sales numbers are out and taking over the top crown occupied in years past by the Ford Taurus, Honda Accord, Toyota Camry. The best selling new car in America is the Little Tykes Cozy Coupe. Not a lot of color choices, as you may know. Comes in standard red and yellow. Like a lot of you, we got one of these babies in the garage. They sold 457,000 units in 08. That is more than any other American car, meaning the real kind. When we come back here tonight, a presidential power you might not have known about okay, and ahead. how it came in handy for a 10-year-old today. Oh, this could be a welcome sight in the skies over California. If the state makes a deal to get this airplane from an Oregon company, the battle against wildfires could be more of a fair fight. Specially fitted 747 Jumbo, it carries twice as much fire retardant as any previous similar aircraft. Test flights were today. Tonight's the night, the TV switchover that turns the picture to hash on television sets that still rely on antennas. You should have gotten a converter box by now if that's the case in your house. It's all part of an ad blitz leading up to this switchover to a digital signal. Millions of Americans watched her grow up on her parents' TV variety show. Chastity Bono, the daughter of Sonny and Cher, announced through her manager today she's getting a sex change. The statement said the decision was years in the making. Chastity Bono recently turned 40 years old. Interesting moment at a presidential town meeting today. The scene, Green Bay, Wisconsin. A man who had a question for the president explained he brought his young daughter along, but she had to skip her last day at school to attend the town meeting. The president was worried and offered to help. <laughs> yeah. D do you need me to write a note? Uh, I'll take you up on that, actually, yeah. Mr. President. <laughs> All right, go, go ahead. Uh, I'll, I'll start writing it now. What's your name? John Corpus. No, her. Oh. <laughs> no, no, I'm serious. So what, what's your oh. daughter's name? Her name? Huh? Her name is Kennedy. Kennedy, all right. That's yes. a cool name. That's a very cool name. Thank you. All right, I'm going to write to, uh, to Kennedy's teacher. There you go. And he did. The president delivered go. the note in person to the right. little girl who, of course, thought better of it, made a copy for her teacher and kept the original for herself. While it is a given in baseball here in the East that Yankees fans and Red Sox fans don't get along, things got a bit rough last night when Boston hosted New York at Fenway Park and Alex Rodriguez came to the plate. Listen to this. You use steroids was the chant in case you couldn't make it out. It could not have helped A-Rod's current slump. He drew a walk on that at bat. The Yanks lost to the Sox for the seventh straight time this season. When we come back here tonight, when the problem is big and the people need help, what works better than a team of professionals? What works? Brought to you by Cadouet. Back to our series of reports on what works. A year ago, Cedar Rapids, Iowa was drowning in the rising waters of the Cedar River. We covered the story night after night. Hundreds of homes and businesses ruined, and they're still not right. But one special group with years of skill and experience is helping get Cedar Rapids better. Here's our own Kevin Tibbles with what works. One could easily mistake these devastated neighborhoods for New Orleans, but this is Cedar Rapids, Iowa. The Rapids. That's our broadcast for this Thursday night. Thank you for being with us. Quick note for our viewers on the West Coast. You may already know this because of the Stanley Cup game tomorrow night. We may either be on where you live at an earlier time or not on the air at all. But a reminder, you can always catch our broadcast on our website, nightly.msnbc.com. I'm Brian Williams. We hope to see you back here tomorrow night in some form. For now, good night from New York.